Please proceed it. And I direct your attention to the New Testament portion that was read to us by Abel, the 17th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. And I particularly focus your thoughts on verse 18. Acts 17, verse 18. Where we read, then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, that is Paul, and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Mm -hmm. Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Now one of the reasons why I have chosen this passage and this text in particular this evening is to do with Abel. I make no apology for that, but we're going to miss Abel as he returns to Singapore and we look forward to his return in due course. And some of you will know, others of you might not, that Abel is reading for a degree in philosophy. And he'll be learning all sorts of things that that subject is concerned to teach. Now already some of you might wonder what the word philosophy means. Well basically it means love of wisdom. The word is a conjunction of two words. The first part, philia, which is love. And then the second part, Sophia, which is wisdom. Which means, therefore, that a philosopher is a lover of wisdom. I don't know whether that sums up Abel, but uh, I think it probably does. If only for this reason, that a Christian who wants not only to have Jesus in his heart, but also in his head, is a lover of wisdom. And the supreme wisdom is the wisdom that comes to us from heaven, from God, through his dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus is described as the wisdom of God. And Jesus is made unto us wisdom as well as righteousness sanctification and redemption as Paul later wrote in his first letter to the Corinthians so there's a very right and proper sense in which a Christian ought not to be afraid in the least of philosophy because it is in one sense quite neutral even though over the centuries philosophy has been thought to be a threat to faith a threat to Christianity but that's only when the wisdom has been false and the love has been bad. But if the love is for the right thing, then philosophy is a good thing. And uh, this truth really does emerge in Acts chapter 17, which was the Apostle Paul's visit to the city of Athens, the great centre of Greek civilization. And let's remember that in the days of the New Testament, there were three great cities in the ancient world. The first was Jerusalem, the second was Athens, and the third was Rome. We may say that Jerusalem was the 
city of God, where God and his worship were maintained and had been for so long. Athens was regarded as the city of learning and of wisdom, of the kind that Paul met when he went to Athens. Rome, the third city, really was the city of power. The city of military power. Of Roman law. And things associated with that. And we may say that in the New Testament there is a battle between these three cities and what they truly represent. And of course Jerusalem is important to us as Christians not only because it was the city of David but it was the city outside of which the Lord Jesus Christ our Saviour was crucified. So Jerusalem for a Christian is the most precious of the three cities. But we live in an age where all these cities are making their influence still. And we're concerned tonight about the city of Athens and how the Apostle Paul faced the people of Athens, especially the thinkers of Athens, with the Gospel. We've got the Gospel, the message of the Lord Jesus, which we find in the Gospels and, of course, in Paul's epistles, coming face to face with all the wisdom and the learning of the philosophers of Greece. Now, the immediate circumstance of all this, of course, was Paul was in Athens for a very uh, particular reason. He was there because he wanted to wait there for Silas and Timothy to come to him as rapidly as possible uh, to work together on their missionary work of spreading the gospel. So Paul had time on his hands. And as a result of that, while he waited, he wandered around the city of Athens. And uh, we're told in verse 16 that he was quite stirred. He was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Because almost on every street corner, there was a temple to some god. Because the Greeks had all sorts of gods and goddesses. The most famous one mentioned in the New Testament, of course, is the temple of the goddess Diana in the great city of Ephesus. There were all kinds of pagan gods, which weren't really gods. They were not much more than sort of um, super type of human beings. But although they were regarded as being above man, yet they had all the defects of human nature. They weren't very attractive gods at all. But people had their own private gods, their own favourite gods. And accordingly, they would go to one temple or another to make sacrifice and to worship and to think that they were doing good. And um, the Apostle Paul, as he wandered around, he was struck by one particular temple and its altar. And we read this in verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considered the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Now the inscription that Paul saw there was not English the words he saw were agnosto theo the unknown God as it's translated in our Bibles and then clearly led by the Holy Spirit he grabbed the opportunity to say well you Greeks you've got all your gods and all your temples and all your altars and you're so anxious that you might not miss any God out so to cover yourselves you have this temple with this altar to the unknown God, so that he's not excluded in any way. Now this unknown God, whom you claim to worship, he's the one that I proclaim to you. You don't know him. I'm going to tell you all about him. 
And then Paul starts off with these, these words here. God who made the world, in verse 24, and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor does he worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Now Paul had done his homework. He hadn't only read the Old Testament, but he read some of the literature of the Greeks, because there he actually quotes a line from the Greek poet Aratus. And that's what he there quotes. We are also his offspring. So what's Paul doing here? He's strongly affirming creation. God who has made everything. Who has made the human race. And that we all come from one base, if you like, of one blood. And then he goes on to, on to say more about this, this, this great God. Verse 29, therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Not only those Jews down in the Holy Land, not only the people of Rome, but you people here in Greece as well. This God... This unknown God, whom I'm declaring to you, he commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance from this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. Now that is what Paul mentioned, he reported as a result of that encounter referred to in verse 18. Certain Epicurean Stoic philosophers encountered him and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said he seemed to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. They'd heard nothing at all like this. The first time they heard about this Jesus and this idea of resurrection, this was utterly alien to all their thinking. Now you've got to bear in mind who were these people? These Epicureans and these Stoic philosophers. Well to start with we should say that um, they didn't like one another. They disagreed. They argued against one another and they discussed endlessly all kinds of questions and that's exactly what we're, we're told. Because in verse 21 for all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either telling or hearing some new thing. They just, it was, there was endless chatter about the latest news, the latest theory, and so on and so forth. Now, a lot of this might not um, relate to us this evening, or even to the young people and the children of that time. But you couldn't grow up in Athens from being a child to being a teenager and then a young person and then an adult without coming under the influence of these kind of people. They did what we would call create public opinion. They would talk, they would discuss, they would argue and mothers and fathers would listen to their theories. Then they would go home and then over meals they would say, what do you think about what we heard today? And then... Uh, the children might say, when that man said so and so, what did he mean, Daddy? And they would talk about these things. And these ideas would come into their heads and they would start to say, well, is this the way I should live? And because of these people who fashioned public opinion, it began to influence the ordinary life of people in the city and indeed throughout Greece. And uh, what is interesting about these two different groups is that they expressed attitudes and ideas which are still very much with us. 
Let me give you, tell you a little bit of background. The Epicureans, who were they? Well, they were named after a man called Epicurus, hence the name, who lived from 342 to 270 BC. And uh, this is what he taught, that man is material. In other words, you're just a bundle of physics and chemistry, and that's all you are. You have no soul. There's nothing spiritual about you. You are simply material. Your mind is your brain and nothing else. That's all there is to you. And when you die, that's the end of you. The second thing they taught was that life is for pleasure. To enjoy life and to try to achieve some kind of tranquility. To get peace of mind. Not to be vexed and to be disturbed and to be upset when life is full of these things that can produce that. And initially, their theory of life was not to be sensual in the immoral sense, but just to use your senses, your sight, your hearing, your touch, and so on and so forth, and enjoy what you are as a being. Now, as time went by, this kind of teaching, which seemed innocent in a sense, became so debased that it really became something like this. You should live to get as much pleasure as you possibly can. And even if it's wrong kind of pleasure, it's still pleasure. There are right pleasures and wrong pleasures in the views of some people. But just get as much pleasure and enjoyment out of life as you possibly can. Indulge yourself. It's a rather selfish sort of way of, of living. They also believed, thirdly, that um, chance rules everything. There's no purpose in life. You go on from day to day without any particular reason for living. You just live until you die. And then, fourth, although they acknowledged all these different gods, yet the Epicureans weren't too keen on them. They only said they worshipped them to keep in with the government and with the establishment. But basically they said, the gods have no role in our personal lives and this delivers us from the fear of what the gods might do. That's what the Epicureans taught. On the other hand, who are the Stoics? The Stoics come from a thinker called Zeno who lived from 335 to 263 BC. And the name comes from the fact that they, he taught in a porch or stoa. That's the Greek word for a, for a porch, like an entry into a building or entry into a garden. And hence the word, the name Stoic became the name of him and his followers. The Roman thinker Seneca was one of these Stoics. And uh, their view was quite the opposite of the Epicureans because the Stoics said you must live according to nature but um, the big thing about living according to, to nature is not living to indulge your appetites and your senses but live according to reason. Use your mind. Don't be governed by your instincts and your, and your appetites and your feelings. Reason is to be the highest expression of your being. That was what they, they taught. So we looked at the four things that define the Epicureans. What are the four things that define the Stoics? Well, man is essentially reason and spirit. Emotions, they said, are dangerous. So you've got to suppress your feelings. They can get you into trouble. They can get out of control. You must be rational. You must be cool in, in, in that unemotional uh, sense. Second, they said that life was for virtue and morality and duty. You have things that you should do in order to improve your life and improve society. But um, their outlook became rigid and rather cold. They were the kind of people who found it very difficult to smile. The Epicureans would love to laugh, not the Stoics. They were quite the opposite in that respect. And third, the Stoics said that fate governs everything. There is a, a force of determinism. We can't change it. 
We have to live within it. We have to accept it. And in the face of suffering and tragedy, they said you've got to grin and bear it. You've got to put on a bold face when tragedy hits and not give way to emotional despair and whining and whinging about the troubles of life. And then fourth, they said God has no personal existence. They taught that universal reason, wherever you find people who can think, who have brains, who have minds, that is where God is. There's a kind of pantheism. God is everything. But God is universal reason. Now these two groups, they, they hated one another really and they often sparked discussions and heated debates here in Athens where Paul had come. And when they heard Paul talking about this Jesus and the resurrection, this was so completely different. It was outside their comfort zone, if you like, outside what they were familiar with. Jesus and the resurrection. What is all this about? They even called Paul a babbler because he was talking and preaching about Jesus and, and who he was and, and what he came uh, to do. Now then, the thing that we have to say about this is that the Epicureans and the Stoics, they failed. Because the society that they produced was the wicked society that Paul describes in Romans chapter 1. With all the idolatry, with all the perversion, with all the wickedness and all the violence and all the evils which ultimately led to the fall of the Roman Empire. Rome had absorbed the Greeks and their culture. But eventually that was the empire which collapsed and it was virtually dominated by the barbarians who later came in the early 5th century. And basically it comes down to this that these two people were trying to answer the question, well, well, what are we? Who are we? Why are we here? What are we to be living for? And the Epicureans said, well, life is, is short. Just enjoy it. Be happy. Get as much pleasure as you can. But as I say, that, that, that degenerated into uh, enjoying some of the most wicked things that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 1, including homosexuality as just one example. And it is rather striking, is it not, that um, compared with our own time, that homosexuality was never legalised in the Roman Empire. It went on, but it was never legalised, like it has become in our culture. So in a sense, we are worse than the Romans were. And then the Stoics says, well, there's more to man than just being driven by your instincts and your appetites. We have reason. We should think we should seek to improve the world. We should try to bring order into the chaos that these Epicureans had created. Because if everyone just goes around enjoying themselves, and what chaos could, could result? And the Stoics wanted to bring order into life, and so on and so forth. And there's no doubt that some of their representatives did have a, a noble kind of influence upon society. I suppose one of the most famous of the Stoics was the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, who in the middle and towards the end of the second century, he was probably the best example of a noble-minded Stoic. But even then, the Stoics, although they were encouraging people to be moral and to be just themselves, and to align themselves with the universal reason, yet they admitted that you can't improve someone else's life if they're not willing to follow what you're following. So they had real, no real hopes of improving the life of people who are just, if I may say, hell-bent on pleasure all the time. So it was a real mix within society. As I have said, read Romans 1. That's the kind of society that these two different groups had produced. Because 
some of the biggest and the deepest questions that life throws at us, they could not solve. And what are those? Well, the inevitable fact of guilt within the human conscience. Because not everyone lived up to these ideals. Some people did go over the top and do dreadful things. And also the ever-present fact of death. We're going to die one day. What does death mean? Is there anything beyond death? Does everything end when we breathe our last? Is ultimately life therefore meaningless? Oh, there were people who believed these things and uh, they lived meaningless lives without any sense of direction or purpose. And the Stoics, who seem to have a good emphasis in some respect to bring order out of chaos, even they could not deal with these fundamental things. And isn't it there that we believe as Christians the gospel scores? It deals with things that neither of these groups could face and answer. What do I mean? Well, you see, these two schools of thought, they're, they're theories of life, how to live, what to pursue and what to avoid. But the Apostle Paul, his message to these people was this. We proclaim someone who has come into the world, who is this divine reason, this logos, this revelation of the God who has made the world and has made us. And his name is Jesus of Nazareth. And Paul says, I come to declare to you who he is and what he's done and what he's going to do. Because although he came to earth and he was born and he lived and he performed the most amazing miracles and then he was crucified, but he was raised again from the dead. And at the end of time, he's going to return and judge the world in righteousness. He will judge all you Epicureans. He will judge all you Stoics. He will judge all you people, whatever uh, view of life you hold. And therefore, we must be prepared for him. So Paul, with great authority here on Mars Hill, as it was known, that he preached to these people. Now, the advantage of Paul's message over the others is very simply this. It wasn't simply, well, you have your theory about life and you have your principles of life. I have better than that. I have a person. A person who can change us and transform us and make all the difference. And we might say that the Epicureans and the Stoics, the strength of their different outlooks was in their ideas, their theories, their opinions. But as far as Paul was concerned, we proclaim facts, not nice <coughs> ideas or theories about life or philosophy. We proclaim facts. Now remember that it was Luke who wrote the Acts of the Apostles, wasn't it? The same Luke who wrote the Gospel by that name. And you can't get away from the sheer emphasis upon the facts of the Christian faith that Luke emphasizes here. For example, in chapter 1 of his Gospel where he says, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which are most surely believed among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent the offers, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. And then he goes on at the very beginning of the Acts, which really is a follow-on in tone from what I've just read, and Luke says the former account, namely my gospel, 
I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he presented himself alive after his suffering, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them during forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. You see what the standpoint of the Christian is. Facts. Events which are absolutely undeniable. Now, Epicurus had been dead a long time. Zeno had been dead a long time. Paul says, my Jesus, whom I declare to you, he was dead, but he's alive. And I'm here to declare to you that he is the only saviour of the world. He's the one before whom we will have to stand in judgment. He's the only one who can help us. Your dead philosophers, they can't help you. And the same, of course, applies to Plato and Aristotle and many other philosophers uh, of whom the Greeks were so proud. They were proud of their thinkers and their philosophers and their reason, but they couldn't deal with the deepest issues of the human heart. And if some of them did fail, did, did succeed and make an impression, what about those who failed? What about those who fell by the wayside, who couldn't live up to the teachings, and whose lives were wrecked and ruined by all sorts of wickedness and so forth? How could they deal with guilt? Well, isn't that the importance of Jesus? You all know the meaning of the name Jesus? It means saviour. It's almost as if Paul is saying here, you Greeks, you Epicureans, you Stoics in Athens, you are riddled with failure, failure in your thinking, because by your wisdom you will never know God. And that's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1. By wisdom the world knew not God. Because basically what was happening here was that the desires for emotion and pleasure which, according to the scriptures, are God-given, had been corrupted through sin. Reason, thinking, our brains, are also a gift of God. But the reasoning and the thinking had been corrupted by sin. So Paul says, you're both wrong. Even though you disagree on many things, you are all alike failures because of this dreadful thing called sin. And that's why we're able to proclaim to you one who is the only hope. His name is Jesus. And what does this do for us as it did for them? Well, if they did think there was a real God, he didn't have much contact with them. He was remote from them. But we know that the coming of Jesus declares that God is personal. It's not fate not some cooked up deity, but God is personal. And he's come to us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, the incarnation. God became man. And the logos idea, that means Greek for word, if you like, which was common in their thinking. How does John believe, begin his gospel? In the beginning was the word, in the beginning was the logos. The true reason of God is God himself coming to us and speaking to us in his Son. The same Saviour through whom God spoke the universe into existence. Jesus is the Logos. He is the one who comes to reveal the living God to us. God is personal. He has spoken. But secondly, Paul would want them to know that the God whom I proclaim is a God who cares. Because there was a lot of unhappiness in the society produced by these different philosophical groups. There was no real compassion, no real care. There was selfishness. There was hostility, unkindness. It spread throughout that ancient society. But says Paul, I proclaim to you a God who cares. And the proof of that was demonstrated in the caring life of this Jesus. I'm filling out, in a sense, 
the elements that Paul gives us here because doubtless he spoke all these things as circumstances uh, permitted. And also the Greeks had no real conception about what was truly holy as well as truly loving and truly just. Because what is justice? Well, if I think something is wrong, it's unjust. But someone else might think that what I think is just is unjust. So there's no absolute standard. We can't be sure what is just. Ah, but God has revealed himself in his law, in his word. He's given us principles. He's given us guidelines which don't depend upon human opinion, as in the case of you philosophers. And to show that God is so concerned about justice in the face of our sin and rebellion, but also this great God who loves and cares for the human race, including you Greeks, he sent this Jesus to the cross. That there he might be our saviour and be punished in our place by the shedding of his precious blood and that we thereby might find forgiveness and new hope in the face of failure. Because that is the thing. They had no answer to failure. If you ended up at the bottom of the heap, what's life all about? And it led to suicide and I don't know what else as a result of these things. But in Jesus there is hope. Hope for the hopeless. Help for the helpless. Paul says, this is the Jesus whom I want you Greeks to know all about. And then even if you laugh at my message, which they did, we are told that um, in verse 32, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul divided opinion. Some thought, hmm, there is something in what he says. Others said, ah, it's a load of rubbish. You're just a babbler. But an impression was made, which later developed in that part of the world, as the gospel did in later centuries, spread. It became what we now know as the Greek, the Eastern Greek Church. So it wasn't all a, a feeble response by any means, as Acts chapter 17 seems to suggest. And then the Apostle Paul fourthly says, I want to remind you that this God whom some of you are laughing at and, and regarding as rubbish, he will send his son to judge the world in righteousness. He says, now he says, you've been ignorant of, of this God and of this Jesus. And probably you have no knowledge of the Old Testament and the teachings of Moses and the prophets of Israel. Although, when I say that, there is some evidence that the teachings of the Old Testament did spill over into the ancient Greek culture. The Logos idea very possibly came originally from the Old Testament. Remember, as we heard in Psalm 33, that by the word of the Lord the heavens were made. If that's in Greek, it's the Logos of the Lord, the heavens were made. And that Logos is a person, it is Jesus, the word who was made flesh. And he is now calling upon you, all you people of Athens, to repent. And there's urgency about this, he says. You say life is meaningless. You go on from day to day without any real purpose or significance. You just live until you breathe your last. And he says, but therefore, he has appointed a day on which he would judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So the Apostle Paul is in full flow, isn't he, in showing the emptiness and the ultimate failure of human philosophies. And they're still with us, my dear friends, too. Because the Epicureans, they became hedonistic, living for pleasure. Isn't that modern society? I think probably Epicureanism is much more prevalent in our culture than we're prepared to admit. Pleasure is the dominant thing that people are pursuing. And it's a tragic state of affairs that we are in. It's all selfishness. It's all self-indulgence. As much as I can get out of life, even at the expense of the 
um, pleasure and the justice of, of other, other people. And that's the problem that we're in today. And there are other people, of course, who are saying, well, you know, things are going too far. And there are some people who are concerned about the direction that our culture is going. I think we may say that some of the elements of the thought of the Epicureans is what has produced immorality on a broad scale. And same-sex marriage and homosexuality and all these other perversions. It flows logically from the principles, albeit corrupted, of the Epicureans. Get as much pleasure as you can. Enjoy yourself, whether it's right or wrong, in the eyes of those who criticise us. And there are some people who are very concerned about this. The Stoics who are warning us to think very, very differently. And there is now a leading professor of psychology in Canada called Jordan B. Peterson, who is criticising with great gusto, with great courage, all the defects of our modern world. And uh, he makes a lot of interesting and positive statements about the Bible and about the scriptures and about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But um, he's giving lots of interviews all over the Western world. And he was at a meeting of evangelical students. And after he spoke in the way that he did, he was asked by an evangelical student, you know, since you seem to have great respect for Jesus and the Bible, why don't you step closer? And his answer was, because I'm a Darwinian. Because he believes in evolution. He's saying a lot of good things which are shaking up the people on the left and the people on the right, but he's still a Darwinian. And what he's really doing, he's lamenting the very fruits of the Darwinian evolutionary idea that he still affirms. So we must pray that people like him, he's, he seems to be a bit of a Stoic. And the Stoics, they want to bring order into the chaos, but they will never be able to do so without Jesus, without the Gospel, without a Gospel that brings forgiveness to guilty, broken lives, without Jesus who brings through the Holy Spirit order into our disorganized lives in sanctifying us in ennobling our thoughts making us live to the glory of God now it's rather interesting too that in the battle between these two groups you know pleasure on one hand and duty on the other there's a sense in which the best examples of these are in the Christian faith because God does not deny us legitimate pleasure in life. We shouldn't ever give the impression that God is a killjoy where pleasures are concerned. There are many of them, many blessings that he gives us. We're meant to enjoy God and his good gifts. As the Westminster Catechism says, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. But sin corrupts these things, so we need a Jesus who will cleanse us and purify our appetites for the things that we do enjoy. To pursue what is good and to avoid what is, what is bad. And then the Stoics, you see, they think, well, we must impose order. We must stop this chaos. But uh, what's the standard that they will use? Is it the standard of their own reason? Are they the measure of everything? And if they think they are able to ma make the standard, doesn't that lead to pride in human self-sufficiency? We are the ones who are able to order lives are right well no that won't work either because our ideas and values as, the, as sin corrupted the pursuit of pleasure so sin has corrupted the use of reason which could lead to tyranny so what is the answer then well the Lord Jesus Christ is the only one who can solve the problem he brings forgiveness and a new beginning he brings us a living relationship with himself, not just a new set of ideas like 12 rules of living. No, he brings us into a personal relationship with himself, with the God who made us. The God who, as Paul said here, is not very far from each one of us. 
he says here that we should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us the Stoic isn't interested in that but it is that which is the glory of the Christian faith and the glory of the Christian life so both these groups they fail mainly because of a failure in emphasis and a failure which is the result of sin. So then Paul winds up his sermon to these people. He says, God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And as we know from the rest of Paul's teaching, all this is climaxing in a new heavens and a new earth. The Stoics and the Epicureans could not banish sin. They had no answer to guilt. They had no answer to death. But Jesus has. Paul proclaimed that. And it's our calling in our day, in a meaningless chaotic age, to bring the order not of human opinion but the order of the word of God. It's not our authority. It's not what I think or what you think. It's what God has revealed in his word. So our calling is what? Well, to proclaim the unknown God. And how many people there are who have no knowledge of the Christian faith? How many children are growing up in families and in schools knowing more about Muhammad and Buddha than they do about Jesus? And the one they need most to know about is the Lord Jesus Christ. But our whole political culture... Uh, doesn't want children to learn about Jesus. But Paul says, you need to know about him because he is the answer. He is the solution. He is the only one. Now, as I say, the immediate impact of Paul's message here wasn't very dramatic. It was a mighty message. It was tailor-made for the thinking of these people. Others said he seemed to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And we are told when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them Dionysius the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So there were some who were converted. Not many at this stage, but there were some. So we must be encouraged to go on proclaiming Jesus and the resurrection. Because as then, so now, he remains the only answer. And the greatest service we can render to our age is to do exactly now and today what Paul did then. So things haven't essentially changed. These doer, miserable, foolish people are still with us. Let us praise God that Jesus is still with us. Let us endeavour therefore to proclaim him and seek to bring blessing to broken hearts and lives. That is the calling of the Christian church. And all in the name of our Jesus. And we're going to close our service now with what I believe is one of the greatest ever Christian hymns. Because it fills out the glory of the person whom Paul was preaching here. We haven't sung it for a long time. I don't remember when I last um, chose it or even Stephen chose it. But it is a, it is a mighty hymn which should fill our hearts with a sense of wonder and glory and a sense of privilege of being a Christian and of being a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ and to show that the however many degrees students might get in this philosophy or that philosophy or any other study it is ultimately fruitless and meaningless unless we know him who is the true wisdom. And let us therefore acknowledge the true wisdom, Jesus. Let us love the true wisdom. Let us be true philosophers to his glory and to the blessing of others. 
Amen. Amen. So the hymn that we're going to sing <coughs> is 116. Hymn 116. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark, how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but his own. Awake, my soul, and sing of him who died for thee, and hail him as thy chosen king through all eternity. Hymn 116. And now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. 
And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our